here I am. Hello. He nanny, here I am. All right, you know, we're going to have to do something with this. All right, there we go. I fell off right now. But that would have <laughs> sucked, right? Okay, here we are. We're still in the first book of Isaiah, or the first chapter of Isaiah. Because there's so much stuff in here, we just cannot jam through it. Amen? We're going to have to kind of take it in little bite-sized chunks. So we're going to open up in Isaiah 1, verse 10 through 20 to 90. Amen? And it goes like this. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've gotten enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices, incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the callings of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and, and sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are like red, they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Whoa. Father, we lift this up to you tonight, Lord, and we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us now, to, to guide us through this, Father, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts for the message you have for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. Okay, so this is the opening. How fake worship... How is fake worship like wearing a raincoat in the shower? It, it's worthless. Has anybody ever worn a raincoat in the shower? Just curious. One person? Okay. That, that <laughs> explains a lot. Fake worship is just like that. It's like uh, driving a car with no wheels. It's worthless. Right. A motorcycle without a chain or a belt drive. You're just going to sit there idling. And this is what the problem was right now. You remember from last week, God talked to the nation and, and, was, and was laying out all the issues that were going on in the nation and that they had completely rebelled against him. And not only rebelled, they turned backwards. In fact, they, they weren't even listening. They, they didn't even want to listen. They were running their own program, and they literally were running their own programs to the point of, setting up their Sabbaths and their festivals and things to fit their schedule, not God's schedule. They weren't, they weren't just, just disobeying the law of God. They were writing their own religion that fit their own agendas. And so this is where we kind of pick up the story right now because at the end, he referred to them as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, everybody knew, and everybody knows the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that, and it's not just a, about a homosexual thing or anything along those lines. It was about utter and total rebellion to God, completely disobeying God's law, not just being disobedient, but completely ignoring it like it didn't even exist, yet still acting like they had this relationship or religion with them, which is all phony and fake. And this is where God's trying to get them to pay attention and go, hey, you guys have not only just turned away from me, you're not even my kids anymore. But he said that he... That, that there was a remnant left. And the reason, and I'm telling you right now, God would have just wiped them off the face of the earth, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. But that small remnant was the line of David because the Savior had to be born from that line. And so God saved that one remnant right there. And from that remnant, here we are today. This is where we pick this thing up. And he says, Hear the word of the Lord, O you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, he wasn't calling them Sodom and Gomorrah. He was associating them, the leaders of Judah, with the total rebellion and disregard to him. That's what he was talking about there. In, in, light, in, in talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, what had happened was that God had sent word 
And they were completely like, you know, we don't, we're not going to do anything you say. We're, we're not even listening to you. Your law means nothing to us. And we don't care what you have to say. Boom! And then it was like sulfur and body parts and eyeballs. There was one dude in, in Gomorrah that had blue eyes. One blew this way and one blew that way. <laughs> okay, anyway, I'm sorry, but I couldn't resist that one there. Remember in, in, the, in 1 Samuel, he said, It's better to obey than sacrifice, to listen than, to, than the fat of rams. It's better to not have to do sacrifice because you're not doing evil before the Lord. That's what Samuel was saying. That's what God was saying. And all this stuff we're going to talk about right now was null and void. All the stuff they were doing, and to be honest with you, it still happens today in churches in America. Amen? So check out what happened here. He says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Why are you doing it? What is all this sacrifice and fake religion and fake worship? Why are you bringing this to me? Do you think that I'm that dull that I don't understand what you're doing? Do you think that I'm, I'm like some cosmic bonehead that when you come up saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's just lip service. And furthermore, it's for the, the benefit of those around you, not to me. So, says, says the Lord, I have, I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. And what was happening is the sacrifices were endless. It was, it was going on and on and on and on and on. Kind of like uh, they're, they're being used like a get-out-of-jail-free card. They would do something, they'd kill a bull and stuff. And now check this out. As they were creating their own kind of religion, the, the laws and traditions were being bypassed. In other words, the, the annual like the atonement and, and Yom Kippur and all that, when, when the priests would go up and make sacrifice, now they were doing all this stuff on their own. So it made it easy for them to be like, okay, I can go out and you know, kill my neighbor or something like that, and I'll just go to the temple and chop off a bull's head or something like that, and I'll be good. And, and in God's eyes, he's like, all you're doing is murder twice. You killed that guy over there, and now you killed the cow. None of this is true worship. None of this is true repentance. And you're not even stopping what you were doing in the first place. But they were appeasing themselves. They, in their own mind, they completely cut God out of the equation. It wasn't about going to God and ask forgiveness and repentance and and turn away from the sin. They just went and killed the bull. And the way they were working all this stuff out, they were creating all these festivals and stuff to make themselves not feel guilty for what they were doing. And what it, what it essentially was, their hearts were hardened. Their spirit was completely crushed. They were running on nothing but man-made power right there. He says here in 12, when you come, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? to trample my courts. You guys are just bombing in here any old time you want. You're just trampling around and all this stuff. You're knocking each other over trying to get up there and get forgiveness for sin, but you're forgiving yourself. You're not coming to me, says God. You're not coming to me in true worship and true repentance and these sacrifices that was set up by God. That was a sacrificial system. They completely bypassed God in the sacrificial system. He's going, who required this? I didn't tell you to do this stuff. All this stuff you're doing is a bunch of waste of time is what's going on there. And, you know, to be honest with you, they were bypassing a lot of things that we do today. We bypass a lot of stuff, too. Look what he says here. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. So this, this incense wasn't sanctioned by God. But there's incense that the priest, remember the priest would burn the incense and all that. Well, they were bringing in like Nag Champa and all kinds of other incense that they liked to smell. And, and not even with the priest. They were just doing it on their own. They're lighting incense and they're going, oh, Shandala Bundle of Money should have had a Honda, but a bit of Harley. Cut off a lamb's head, throw some incense down, and they're like, walk out of there. They're like, woo, I feel great, man. I'm, I'm awesome. In fact, check this one out. New moons, the Sabbaths, and the call in of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. So these meetings were set up on a specific time by God. This new moon thing, what that was about was every month there'd be a, a new moon, right? Well, every month they would go and do their incense thing and kill something or whatever it was. And in their minds, even maybe in their hearts, 
they were good to go. They got a new moon, it's a new me. And off they would go for the month. They'd start getting toward the middle of the month. They're like, okay, I'm getting a little crazy here. I better start, you know, tampering it down a little bit. Book into the temple, do a little sacrifice, this and that. And at the new moon, I'll just get washed clean. And God's looking at that. He's going, I can't endure this. I can't stand it anymore. Oh, these are sacred meetings that you're completely stepping on and the traditions of and bypassing the priests even. Check this out. He goes like this. This is really wild, man. He goes, I cannot endure any good sacred meetings, your new moons and your feasts. My soul hates. Listen, when God says my soul hates about something, you should really pay attention. Because God's soul hated Sodom and Gomorrah and the rebellion and sin that was going on there, and he destroyed them completely off the face here. Remember the story of Noah? God actually looked, at, looked upon man and how sinful and unrepentant and completely rebellious it was. And he said, I wish I'd never even created this. That's how bad it got. And here's the deal. When you pick a fight with the creator of everything, you're probably going to lose. Just saying, right? So he says, my soul hates, they are trouble to me, and I'm weary of bearing them. He tried. He tries, and he tries, and he tries. And he calls. Does anybody answer he and any? No. Nobody was answering, here I am, send me. They don't even hear in his voice anymore. At that point, they had become so hard-hearted that they created their man-made system of sacrifice and forgiveness of their sins. God wasn't even involved in this, and it gets even worse. Check this out. He says, when you spread your hands out, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Now, certainly that's an allusion to, to sin, blood and sin on the hands. But at the time that this is all happening, people were doing their own sacrifices. And, and here's the crazy thing. You'd bring a sacrifice to the temple. And, you know, later on in the time of Jesus, you know, this was, this was 750 years before Jesus. But at the time of Jesus, the priest would look at it and, and inspect it. And if it was flawed, they'd reject it. And you have to buy one of their little animals that they already pre-approved at a pretty, you know, stiff price and stuff like that. If you wanted your sins forgiven. Or you could run off somewhere and try to find the perfect one. But as it went, the corruption was so bad, you'd never find an animal worthy. And so here, this system that should have been to priests, and, I, and you know, some of them were, you know, it's not like completely systemic. There was, there was some that were still following the traditional rules, bring the, bring the animal to the street. Well, these people were literally doing their own sacrifices, bypassing the priestly system, some of these people. And God's going, look, that isn't a forgiveness of sin. That's not the way the system works. But they were so far gone they really believed that they were walking a right path. Now, this is where it brings it into us and our time now that there's Americans in the American church that are walking the walk of being a Christian, but they're not. They're, they're completely bypassing any true heart relationship with God and repentance and forgiveness. And he knows it. They'll come up and apologize. I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. You know, forgive me, Lord. But they don't mean it from their heart. They're not approaching him humbly and truly asking for his forgiveness and they walk away and go Ooh, i feel much better but in god's eyes you haven't accomplished anything because you're truly faking your worship to him and you know what god created all of us he knows all right when 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 our yes isn't yes and our no isn't no god knows that stuff so people that are coming in and punching their christian time clock so they can sit in a church and get their church time in so their friends and their family like, oh man, he's so, what is that word? He's so, uh, I don't know, it's like religious, but there's probably a nicer word for it. He goes to church, she goes to church. They're really church-going people. But in reality, it's nothing but part of a show. It's just like a, a curtain that you pull in front of people, and not you guys necessarily, unless it is you guys. And there's no true relation. You can walk in, and walk out with never feeling the Holy Spirit, never participating in worship, never feeling prayer, not even understanding the Word of God. Half the time, some of these people spend more of their time on their phone. They're not listening to what the pastor's saying, and, and in sin, they're not listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying. That's what was going on here. It was, it was a man-made worship, and God said, I'm sick of it. 
I've tried, I've sent prophets, I've done this, I've done that, but you've reached this point of complete obstinance toward me. We have no communication anymore. You guys are running around like a bunch of chickens with your head cut off thinking everything is all right. But the fact of the matter is judgment will come and you guys are going to be all surprised. Why is this happening? It's happening because you've turned your back on God. That's what was going on here. Now, they hadn't reached the point of Sodom and Gomorrah yet where they turned backwards and completely ignored God, but they were on their way. And he's trying desperately to bring them back in this book right here. I got to tell you, the, the spoiler is ain't going to work. But anyway, this just shows you how cool God is. He says in verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. It's really easy. But when people get stuck on stupid and they want to run their own program, they get so tunneled in on their goofy life that they don't even realize how crappy their life really is and how much better and blessed it could be if they would just stop rebelling against God. But sometimes people get to the point where they're like, well, I've been rebelling and rebelling and nothing really bad's happened. I mean, I'm, I'm living a pretty good life right now. I got a nice trailer, you know, that I, I parked under a tree and every now and then I get a new dog or something like that. So, I mean, I got a roof over my head and God's like, I have so much more for you. I have so much more for you, so much more for you to do out there if you would just stop. And he says, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doing before my eyes. Just stop doing the stuff that you're doing. It's really not that hard. Quit running people over in the crosswalk. It's not cool anymore, man. There was a time. All right, I get it. There was like, remember the points? You get 10 points for that one, 20 points for someone with a walker. Okay, I remember all that stuff. God's going, enough of that. Don't do it anymore. All the armed robberies you guys are pulling, stop, man. That's ill-gotten gains. God is not okay with it anymore. You guys that are slinging dope, who's dealing drugs in here? No one ever raises their hand on that one right there, man. Oh, Doc's pointing them out right now. That one, that one. How do you know? <laughs> Oopsie. Anyway, he says, put away the evil that you're doing before my eyes. Just stop it. Come on. He goes, look, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the oppressors. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come on. Just act like a child of God. Be a child of God. Stop all the junk and remember who you are in God. Well, we remember who we are in Christ. Amen. It's, it's really kind of like simple mathematics here. And I'll get to that part here in a second. But look at this beautiful verse. After all that stuff last week and all the horrible stuff that was going on last week and the iniquities and all that. Then we have this week where he's going, all your festivals, it's all fake. I'm not buying any of it. I'm not receiving any of it. You guys are getting further and further away after all that. Now, me as God, it would be over right then. It would be like lightning bolts, floods, like locusts with stingers that are poisonous, stuff like that, like snakes that bite. I would just unleash, but I'm not God. It's probably a good thing that I'm not God. Amen. Actually, I probably wouldn't go. I'd just let my angels do their thing. I'd be like, okay, you guys have been kind of waiting for a fight? Let's get it on. Let's get ready to rumble. And but God says this in verse 18. Come now. This is where he nanny comes in. Here I am. Come now. God's talking to each one of us tonight. Come now and let us reason together. God is willing to sit down and talk with you. Have a conversation with you. Help you understand where you are and how far you've drifted. Because a lot of people don't even know. They think they're all cozied up with God, but they're not, man. They're still stuck on stupid out there. And he's like, hey, come here. Check this out. Let's sit down and talk. This is where we all go. He nay nay. Here I am. Let's talk. I'm ready. And, and it's a humble heart when you got to sit before God and he starts pointing out your stuff. Kind of like the, the uh, roll tape. Because you're like, I've been doing really good, God. I mean, I don't know what the big deal is here. Let's go to the tape. And there you are with your little roadhouse mask on and you, you're holding up a liquor store. Listen, if you guys are going to do that stuff, if you're going to do like drive-bys and you're going to do like liquor store hold-ups or muggings at ATMs, don't wear your roadhouse mask, man. It's like there's cameras and stuff like that. And, and they look at me and they're like, well, that explains it. I'm like, What's that mean? Look at Crusher. 
Jeez. Look at some of the women around here. Anyway. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Look, he goes, look, he's not even like, like trying to tear you apart or anything. He goes, look, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. I know you're jacked up. I know you're far away from me right now, but I can draw you back in. All the, all the sin, I can remove it from you. He goes, look, though they are red like crimson, they shall be white as, well, their sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as well. He's given us, he's given us the, this side and this side. He's given us the total spread apart. Going, look, this is where you are right now. All this junk over here, even though it's in your life, I know it is. I know what you're doing. I know that you're far away from me. I know that your prayers aren't reaching me. I know that your worship is fake. It's not for real. But look, I'll make it white. I'll make it like snow. I'm offering, says God, total forgiveness. But there's a requirement to it. He goes like this. If you're willing and obedient, the two things that are super important. Hineni is all about willingness and obedience. When we say Hineni, we're saying, here I am. All of me, right now. No questions asked. You point that way, I'm going that way. You point that way, I'm going that way. You want me to pray for him? I'm praying for him right now. You want me to wash their feet over there? Give me a bucket. There's no hesitation in Hineni. None. It's all about completely trusting whatever God says that he's in it, he's got a plan, and not only that, but he is willing himself because he says he nanny back to us. We call out to God, he nanny, he says, he nanny, here I am, child. Let's get this thing going. And we don't hesitate, we don't question it. Well, I can't talk. I can't walk. I don't really like being near people's nasty feet, Lord. When you reach that point spiritually, Nasty feet are a blessing because now you're looking at them like these feet are gnarly. There's toe jam and all this stuff, but I've been given and blessed with the opportunity to get in there with a Brillo pad and a freaking wire brush and really do some work on this person's feet, man. When they walk away, they're going to be like, wow, my feet are pink and they feel so good. And you just bless that person. You go wash your hands, do the hand sanitizer and all that stuff, but you know that you followed God obediently and willingly. And he says, if you do that, you shall eat the good of the land. In other words, you will be blessed abundantly the way God wills you to be blessed. Not the way you might want. It might not be a new car. It might not be a new house. You know, it might not be new socks or whatever it is that you're chasing after. But God's will will bless you abundantly beyond your wildest imagination. God loves to bless his kids, man. He loves, God's a giver, man, and he's a way maker. There might be things in your life that are jacked up right now. Be willing and obedient to follow him and call out that he and and watch what happens in your life. When you start working on other people, all of a sudden the stuff that's piled up behind you, you turn back around to face it and it's like just a little hill because God deals with things and he gives us the knowledge and the provisions to fix our life, man. But if you're going at it with a hammer and a chisel on your own, check it out, man. You're going to be chiseling for a long, long time, man. I promise you. But if you're willing and obedient, you're going to chisel your life into a beautiful statue, man. It's going to be super cool. But there's a but here. But if you refuse and rebel, all that stuff we just got done talking about over there, if you choose to just stay stuck on stupid forever, this is what he says. You shall be devoured by the sword. Now, there's a two-way on this thing. First of all, the Word of God will devour you. If you choose to rebel against the Word of God and you call yourself a believer, the Word of God will destroy you. Eventually, the guilt, the pain, the shame, and all this stuff, eventually you'll just push the Word of God away and go, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. Every time I read it, it's like a knife in my heart, man. I don't want to read it. What? Duh! That's what it's supposed to be, man. It's the basic instructions before leaving earth. And if you're going to push it away and try to circumvent, or even sometimes you get to this and you're like, oh, I don't like that part. And you tear the page out and throw it away. That's just rebellion, man. And this is what God says is going to happen. You'll be divided by the sword. Well, these people, guess what happened? Babylon and the sword. And we're going to get to that a little bit down the road there. But this is the most important part to me in this whole study. For the mouth of the Lord 
has spoken. God has spoken to all of us in this room right now, to anybody that watches this video out there, God's word has spoken from his mouth. Through his word, you have a choice here. Simple mathematics. Be obedient and not rebellious. Eat good. Be rebellious and ignore his law. You're going to die. I'm not talking about physical death, which may happen. I don't know. But certainly spiritually, you will get more and more and more. What's the word when your muscles don't work anymore? Atrophy. Spiritual atrophy. Till your heart is hardened. You can't even hear the word of God. You look at the word of God and nothing makes sense to you anymore. It doesn't even have an impact. It doesn't even leave a dent. And check it out. If you're a believer and you've given your life to Christ, when you turn away like that, there's probably nothing more pitiful on the face of the earth than a fallen back Christian that's backslidden away from God. They are a buzz kill at a party. People want to party and do whatever, then there's this Christian over there in the corner crying, oh my God, I can't believe I did that to God. They're like, dude, can you just like go in the garage or something? It's really a drag, and I've seen them, and it's not a pretty sight. Here's your get it question tonight. Dad made it clear that fake worship wasn't cutting it. Can you agree with that? And if you're guilty, talk to Dad about it. All right, if you've been holding back, if you've been playing games with God, you think you're going to okie doke this or okie doke that, look, just talk to God. He said, come now, let us reason. He's ready right now tonight to have a conversation with you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his only son to stand in our stinking evil place and to pay the debt for our sin, man. You know what Jesus did on the cross? He defeated the verse in Romans said, that says, for the wages of sin is death. Because we're already guilty, the gavel's come down, the, the sentence has been passed, the verdict is death. That's what we deserve. Jesus went to the cross and paid that whole debt. Don't you think at this point that maybe we can draw a little bit nearer to the king? Just a little bit? So he, then in the second one, how has American worship slipped into just going through the motions. We see it a lot. And I'm not knocking churches or anything because I'm not that kind of pastor. But a lot of stuff has become the big show. Yeah. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it becomes cool to be part of the big show. And maybe to sit in the big stadium and just look around at everybody in awe, like, man, do the lights, the sound system. Man, that band rocks, and they don't make mistakes or anything, man, because their pastor knows how to play guitar. Well, anyway, the whole time, the pastor's preaching the word of God, and they're not hearing a word of it, man, because it's in the big show. I remember going to a big church between um, Center Point and Set Free, and I was kind of Christian gypsy for a while, and I was hitting different churches. And I, I was riding my bike, and I remember riding in one day early, and like this herd of people came parking and like they got out of their cars and they were like cattle. And I'm like, wow, that's so cool, man. Everybody's like going into church, man. This is awesome. So I went in there, listened to the word. It was really pretty cool. It was a great church, by the way, a good pastor and a friend of mine. Well, after it, I went back out on my bike and everybody herded back out into their cars and left. And there was nobody there. And I was like, wow, that's weird because I'm used to fellowship. I'm used to hanging out and talking and hugging. You know, we're a huggy group of people here. Well, you know, pre-COVID, we were a lot more huggy. But anyway, I sat there on my bike, man, and then another group of cars came in, and another herd of people went in. So I'm like, I'm going to go sit through the second service. I did, same message, all that went, jammed back out to my bike. And you know what happened? The herd came back out, got in their cars, and left. And I was thinking, man, where's the fellowship? And I mean, I'm not knocking them. Maybe that's just their gig or something like that. But at that moment, I'm like, I don't think this is the place I need to be, man. I think I need, you know, coming from a small church in the first place, I'm used to family and fellowship. And I did. I burned rubber out of there, and I, I started hanging out over at Center Point in Biker Balcony at Center Point for a few years until, you know, the roadhouse became what it became there at Center Point, as a matter of fact. We got to be careful about this going through the motion thing, and we got to be careful that if we're we have family members that are kind of doing the whole show and tell thing, you know, 
to talk to them, man, and, and remind them that wherever they go to church, that's God's house. That's a house of worship, and that's what they're there for. It's not to go hang out and socialize and impress your neighbors or anything like that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the building looks like. What matters is the true worship from our hearts to God. That's why we come together as a family. That's what this whole gathering is all about, that we worship together as a family. Amen? Okay, here's the application. Why, what does our nation face if we don't return to true worship? I'll tell you something right now. I don't know if any of you guys are into, into Jonathan Kahn, but that boy, he's the guy that, that wrote The Harbinger and The Harbinger 2. He did the big, remember the return that just happened in September and Jonathan Kahn was you know, putting all that stuff together. If you want an idea of what's coming, check out some of Jonathan Kahn's stuff. Check out The Harbinger because God has warned us over and over and over again. And... We're not there yet. I'm here to tell you the church in America is still strong, but there's a major group that aren't talking to God about our government, about our country. They're still kind of running their own program like that, and we need to encourage other Christians to join together in prayer, return to God in true worship and true repentance, and just be what he called us to be. When we answered that call, we all said the sinner's prayer. We all received Christ as our Savior. That moment, whether you know it or not, you cried out, he nanny. I don't know if you know that, but you did. When you received Jesus as your Savior and Jesus forgave your sins, you gave your life to Christ. You said, he nanny, here I am, send me. And a lot of people went. They went wherever God sent them, under bridges or whatever. But many just took that as like a get-out-of-jail-free card, man. Like fire insurance. Well, I said the prayer. Now I'm not going to hell. When I die, I'm going to heaven. Let me tell you something, man. It doesn't work like that. It's not a lip service thing, and then you get these little tickets to heaven. In fact, the Word says that we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus is Savior. Amen? And when it's all just about words, I got some news for you, man. You might be surprised what is really written on your ticket amen and it may not be pearly gates just saying I'm not trying to scare anybody or anything like that but maybe it's time this year in 2021 for a little bit of a heart check and a little bit of a reality check as to where you really stand in your salvation amen which leads us to this right now if anybody's here that is questioning their salvation maybe they they feel the need to rededicate their lives to christ Maybe there's somebody out there in TV land watching this video that's going, man, after all that stuff, I think I need to have a relationship with Christ. I really want to be saved. Well, this is your moment right now because we're all going to pray together. I'm going to pray a prayer, and you just repeat after me. You're going to be talking to Jesus. It's, it's about your heart, giving your life to Christ. The word, hinani, here I am. That's what's going to be happening for you right now. We're all going to pray with you. Amen. So let's all pray together. Father God, I sinned against you, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can I get an amen? All right, so if you prayed that prayer for the first time and you believe that in your heart that you really have a desire to seek Jesus as your Savior, Check it out, man. It's a new day for you, man. It's your birthday. Amen? Yeah. It's your day to cry out to God. He, nay, nay, here I am. And you know what? Life's going to change, but it'll be a good change. Amen? So until next time, keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. <laughs>